All right, uh, may I ask people in the back to continue the conversations in the lobby and close the door, please? Thank you. Um, last but not least, le meilleur pour la fin. <laughs> I'm delighted to be uh, introducing these uh, last discussions on organizing towards digital justice in Europe. Um, when we you know, talk about changing systems and reflecting about systems, um, I really think that these are the people who actually walk the talk. Um, and this felt like a very important conversation to also include today because changing systems also starts by reflecting and having the ability to reflect and to think as well whether um, the digital rights field is the appropriate one to really rethink the systems and what kind of ecosystems we need for that. Um, so for three years, um, these people here were part of a larger group of people thinking about um, decolonizing activities and sets of programs for the field. And we are really happy to hear some of the results for these visions for digital justice. So I'll pass on to Sarah Chandler for EDRI to introduce the rest of the participants and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Right, welcome everybody. Thank you for maintaining your energy throughout what was a very intense day of discussions and coming to our panel, and for even coming closer. <laughs> so you can <laughs> be closer to us, that's very sweet. Um, so it is an absolute pleasure to be here with you today um, speaking about organizing for digital justice and really when we conceived of this panel, what we hope to do is to speak to a vision. Um, and that was, as Claire said, a vision that emanated from three years of collective work in uh, the process of decolonizing digital rights in Europe. And we'll hear more about that process in the course of the panel, but really much take what you hear today as sort of some thinking that came from a process which was a process that ended up mostly amongst friends, a lot of deep work about, about content, but also really about the way we organize, the way we deal with social issues, the way we view digital rights and justice in the context of a broader social, economic, political movement um, in a wider world, basically. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you today this beautiful panel. Um, he'll be talking through some of these issues with me. Um, this is not a formal panel, so it's actually going to be co-moderated, like much of the work that we're talking about, uh, between myself and Laurence Meyer, all the way over here. Laurence is the racial and social justice lead at the Digital Freedom Fund, DFF, um, and DFF was the co-lead of the Decolonizing Digital Rights Project. Welcome, Laurence. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I expect you all to say hi like that after. <laughs> Next up, we have Miriam Duo. Hi. <laughs> Miriam is uh, a racial and climate justice activist and is also recently working at um, Oil Change International, if that's correct. Um, and so will be, is one of the participants in the decolonizing uh, digital rights process and will speak to some of those experiences and reflections there. So welcome, Miriam. And just over here to my left, Luca Stevenson. Bonsoir. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Luca has prepared a song for us uh, to start the, the discussion. Luca is director of programs at the European Sex Workers Rights Alliance, an amazing movement of self-organized sex workers in Europe, um, and also one of the participants of the Decolonizing Digital Rights in Europe program. So there's a theme here today, which I'm sure you're following. Um, 
I'll just jump, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll just jump right into the, some of the issues we want to talk to you today. A lot of the other panels that we've heard um, about, super interesting, they were a lot about uh, content, digging into a specific analysis of specific uh, digital rights issues that we see. We've heard about privacy in big tech, we've heard a little bit about climate justice, we've heard many different specific issues. He will take a little bit of step back from that, as well as talking about some themes about coloniality in terms of how we understand coloniality in respect to digital rights. The main purpose of this panel is to speak about how we organize rather than actually necessarily only what we organize on. So we're really specifically looking at the dynamics of how digital rights issues are addressed in the digital rights field, but also in the broader, in the broader social justice context. So a lot of this will be about practice, this conversation. But before we do that, we need to talk about what are we talking about when we talk about decolonizing digital rights, and there is some content in there. So the first part of our discussion will be a, a conversation about what does col coloniality even mean in a digital context, in a context of technology production. What does that mean, and what are we talking about when we're talking about decolonizing digital? How does tech play a role? in uh, maintaining and servicing colonial projects in Europe and in the rest of the world. So to start off that conversation, um, I would like to turn to you, Miriam. Um, we're in a context where we've talk, spoken today a little bit about the context of extractivism, which, as we all know, is a very relevant topic to not just the use of technology, but specifically the production process. Could, so could you please talk a little bit more about that, please? Yes, um, and please just blink at me if I speak too much. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's a very relevant topic, like you said, for both, from my perspective, the climate justice perspective, but also the digital rights perspective. I think extractivism and colonialism cannot be detangled. The spaces and the lands and the countries that were colonized were colonized for a reason and the link between the resources that were in those countries and why they were colonized and why you know global north countries fought over those countries is a big reason you can argue the fossil fuel industry is the economic arm of colonialism um, and what we see now is less about fossil fuels and more about rare minerals and some people argue that minerals are the new fossil fuels and that's the kind of with that comes colonialism 2.0, where you basically have the exact same dynamics that have been happening for centuries um, of a company with the mandate and the support and the backing of a country comes into a land that's been colonized to extract, extort, pillage. With that comes displacement of population, death, violence, gender-based violence, etc., trauma, all the things that you can imagine. And so these are kind of broad dynamics that happen globally. If you look at, um, there's a great website that's called uh, the Decolon Decolonization Atlas, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that has a great map on a lot of things, but one of them is uh, minerals and the rare minerals that we need for a lot of things, be it solar panels, be it electric cars, be it phones, computers, etc. cetera. Um, and basically this map is global north versus global south, and it's very, very clear. Um, one specific example that I'll talk about today is, is what's happening in Congo. Um, I hope all of you know what's going on right now, but there is a silent genocide happening. Uh, the people are being enslaved to work in mines, including children. Um, and Congo holds 50% of the cobalt reserves in the world, which are used um, to make batteries that are in our phones, uh, our computers, including our cars and also um, Colton, which is also used for, um, for phones. And so this is basically the kind of curse of Congo in a way because it leads to um, the extractivism and those companies coming in in full impunity um, to extract those resources. And the consequences on the populations are dire. I just mentioned you know, everything that happens. And, um, and it's very interesting to see also the way that it's portrayed there was a New York Times article from December um, about the situation in Congo, and I mean, the shamelessness of mainstream media is just still staggering to me to this day, but 
it, it was full of, oh, the Congolese army is just notoriously rebellious, or, you know, people can't organize, and, you know, oh, all those refugees are all over the place, and there was no mention of the tech companies benefiting from those resources. Who is getting, who is sending those companies, who is benefiting from the mineral that are extracted along the supply chain and the production chain, <clears throat> because along that chain is, you know, the first extraction in the mine, and then how those devices are built is another issue of workers' rights around the world in other places, et cetera. So it is all, all a kind of chain that is very much linked and those dynamics are everywhere. Um, and there was no mention of that. And that is one of the few pieces about Congo I could find on mainstream media. So that kind of tells you the, the scale of the problem. And of course, it shouldn't be surprising that mainstream media is supporting colonial dynamics, um, but it still is to this day, I mean, it's 2024, um, it, it, it is still kind of shocking. Um, and I think that's something that is interesting from, from the climate perspective, but also I see a lot of those dynamics in, in, in tech as well, is the kind of green capitalism, right? So instead of looking at what are the real solutions to the crisis that we're facing right now, which are capitalism and system change and, and needing to overhaul the way we live, especially in the global north, it's, oh, everybody will switch your car to an electric car and we'll be fine. Buy a fair phone and you'll be fine. And it's, it's just, I mean, again, it's, it's a distraction to not look at the real problem, the real solutions, but it is really something that I think is, is a link between both our movements that we should work on and talk about and face head on and address because, again, it's, really not mentioned at all, um, and I haven't seen a lot from the tech world on the NGO side about what's happening in Congo and kind of, you know, lifting that voice and amplifying um, the people trying to get the word out on, on what's happening on the ground. Uh, but for me, that's kind of a staggering example um, of the, the main discourse on the change that we need and the solution that we need, um, which are just contributing to more harm and it's just a copy paste of what we did before with another type of resource um, that's just gonna keep benefiting the people who are benefiting from it and keep harming the people who've been harmed from it, who are, in the case of climate, on the front line of the crisis as well. I'll maybe just stop here. No. On that depressing note. No, that was perfect and I think like you already come into what one example of here, like why we've focused on the word decolonizing and the concept of colonialism as opposed to racial justice or worse terms like diversity and inclusion is because there is a specific historical, ongoing economic. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for the triggering word DNI. Um, the reasons we're using those words are like. Yes, something always happens and we get on a stage. What is it? <laughs> is that too annoying? Shall I continue? Or It's too annoying. Ah, there we go. Okay. The, a, a great reason why we're using this frame, right? It's not just that we want a slightly different perspective. It's not just that we want more perspectives in the room. We also want that. But we also want a specific socio-economic and historical lens with how we view digital issues. Um, and the example of extractivism in, Co in Congo is a really good one. Um, another one that I wanted to bring in that is related to the tech, uh, the, the process of looking at tech as, and, and tech production in the service of colonial projects is related to another issue that we cannot ignore right now and we cannot uh, hold events without speaking about. That is the role of um, technology, surveillance technology in the service of occupation and genocide in Palestine. So. Here is a very good example of how tech infrastructures are used as methods of population management, of surveillance and maintaining racial difference, and how that is a historical trend. So we are witnessing a genocide in Palestine right now. Um, that's the culmination of 75 years of colonial occupation and violence. And now what we really come to understood is that digital infrastructures in many ways. Um, so we could be talking about platforms here and their, the way they've censored content, um, especially of Palestinian activists and just everyday people. We've seen examples from the perspective of um, crackdowns on tech infrastructure, 
for example, on the telecoms um, infrastructure in, in Gaza right now. We've also seen our beloved AI, <laughs> this concept being used in the direct service of genocide, um, a really interesting inf investigation. If anyone would like to look more into that was the investigation made by um, 972 magazine that looked into at the end of last year, the AI warfare um, systems, which were essentially AI generated targets generating more targets targets for the purpose of warfare, which were less accurate, but causing more destruction. A clear example how surveillance technology and warfare technology have been used in the service of a colonial project that is continuing today in Palestine. A little side note, it's sometimes hard to talk about AI in a broader sort of space where we are not actually viewing the underlying social and political context where we have sort of a neutral view of that topic because we are always told it can be improved, it's neutral, it's, it's whatever. With regulation, it's better. Looking at it in context of how it's used in colonial context, but also of how a concept like AI was created, which is in a military context, for the very purpose of surveilling populations, for, for, for the very purpose of warfare, we also see, therefore, how some tech infrastructures, some tech concepts were always colonial, part of colonial project in some way. They weren't just used like that now, they've always been the case. Um, beyond the current day example of AI warfare in Palestine, you're also seeing sort of a longer example of how surveillance tech in Palestine has been used to control uh, the Palestinian population by the State of Israel. One last example before we move on is uh, the biometric databases that since 1999 have been actively capturing and registering data about all Palestinians in the West Bank. That's the Wolfpack project. Here is an example of how sort of various different examples, various different what seemingly objective databases have been used again for the purpose of controlling, maintaining racial differences and specifically is not an isolated issue. So we're seeing this in various different contexts in the world, including in Europe. And what we can see about that is it's for the purposes of control, management and criminalization of racialized populations, but specifically creating a suspect population based on race. And here I want to stop because I think this example is playing out in very many contexts. Um, and Laurence, I'd ask, could you elaborate some of other, other examples before we move on uh, um, to this. We are really throwing them at you, but I th we think it's important to understand yeah. actually what do we mean when we're talking about colonial examples of tech. Yeah, I think so I'll try and be brief, which is not my forte, so probably I won't. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think it's important to re like give the context because uh, as Sarah said, often what we've uh, been met with when we were talking about this process is that the wording is interchangeable, right? And I think we have to really resist that. Colonialism uh, is a specific process. Uh, Anti-colonialism is a specific uh, type of organizing and struggle. And uh, talking about decolonizing is talking about actually power imbalances and how they were created. So you can't... Uh, use it to say, oh, I'm decolonizing my mind, I'm being nice to my neighbor, this is not what it is about, except if you're occupying your neighbor and you displaced him and you just like killed him. But <laughs> except in that particular situation, it's not decolonizing. Um, <laughs> but so I think another example that I think uh, to, to, sh to show how this colonial framework is very um, uh, everywhere and when we talk about digital rights and digital issues is the question of migration. Um, if you talk about platform workers, you're actually talking about migration. If you talk about uh, well, digital welfare state, you're talking actually about migration. Uh, if you talk about policing, <laughs> you're also very much talking about migration, right? So I think there is no area, and even if you're talking about privacy, and I think uh, probably Luca has much more to say about that, if you don't talk about it with a lens on migration, what you're talking about is just like... Uh, well, I don't know what you're talking about, but, <laughs> but, but, but it's a very, very restrictive uh, understanding of it. 
And we see it, uh, I think like the digital welfare state, uh, the panel this morning was very much talking about it, uh, how migration and colonialism play a key role in how those uh, policies are being drafted. Uh, that means actually it's not, it is, those policies are drafted to exclude people, right? Like the welfare state is a way of keeping people captive and people in keeping people controlled, it is a policing uh, tool. And this policing tool targets specifically poor people because uh, they are the beneficiaries of this system. And in, this, in that category, then a racialized people, and then in that category of racialized people, specifically single mothers, right? So there is like this, like, you can see like the little like uh, Russian dolls uh, here happening. This is true, uh, this has been true in the Netherlands when we look at the Syria case, when we look at Rotterdam. Uh, it's probably going to be uh, proven true also in France uh, with the work that like what Turdinet is doing uh, at the moment in their uh, research uh, before uh, litigation. I think in Serbia, the work that has been uh, done around uh, the question of digital welfare state also proved that it was specifically targeting marginalized uh, communities, uh, so Roma people in, uh, in a specific context. Uh, and as I, we know that migration and the question of Roma and Sinti people are interestingly linked. Uh, so here we see it quite clearly, platform workers, a large part of the platform workers are migrant people, right? Are people in migration, they go to, to those work for many reasons. One of them is that because they don't have access to other uh, means and because that in, in contrast, in comparison to other <laughs> jobs that could be offered to them, that is the most secure, right? But they don't have the same rights. Specifically, if you're undocumented, then it's, it's one of the jobs that you can do uh, that you can access to because you're buying or you're, you're like, uh, someone is like giving you their access. And what we see when we talk, when we look at the rider directive, right, is that actually who does not profit from the rider directive, who is going to be negatively impacted by it, are going to be the undocumented uh, workers. Because if you are asking for actually uh, the right to have an employment contract and the different uh, legislation to have the unemployment contract, who can't access an employment contract <laughs> are the people that are undocumented, right? That have been right now actually uh, be able to work in exploitatious conditions, but still able to work uh, through the, uh, the, uh, the framework of platform workers. I think that's a very good example of like, if you don't actually uh, think about that conditions, then the propositions, even in your advocacy work that you're doing, and even when it's led by workers, uh, is still going to produce very much like exclusionary work that are going to exclude the people that are the most excluded. Um, if you look at the AI Act, at the Migration Pact, I think I'm French, so like the, the most recent uh, French legislation uh, of, uh, on immigration, which is a complete shame, but also like a very natural process of fascization that we're, uh, we've been living through. Um, all of those uh, policies, they have, uh, yeah, I, quite uh, clearly, they have like migration, specific rules for migration. So like, they will protect a lot of rights, not when it comes to migrants. <laughs> like, it seems like migrants don't have rights, they don't have the right to, to rights. Um, so in that particular way and in the negotiation, and I think Sarah can talk more about it, when they had to negotiate, what they were really like, then they, they had some resistance, but what they let go of is everything that has to do with actually abolishing harmful uh, law enforcement systems. And I think if you talk about the AI Act without talking about that, and this framework of understanding what is good AI, and I think uh, Sarah was also talking about the origin, the genealogy of AI, then you're missing a big point. Um, in the French context, the, the, the Article uh, 11, I think, is actually organizing a lot of things around uh, the e-bracelet, uh, so like surveilling, tracking, uh, not only individuals, but communities, right? Because if you put someone with an uh, e-bracelet in a community, what you're tracking is the community because you're tracking how the people uh, move, how the person move, where they go. That means like probably they, they will meet other people that are undocumented. That means you understand like the system there. So actually you're not tracking only one person, you're tracking a community that has been put, uh, that is one of the article um, in the law. And uh, also like the whole idea around, um, sorry, where was I? <laughs> yeah, the e -brace, like, and I think those, that, those policies specifically when it comes to migration, it's about uh, transforming, I, I say that often, transforming your body into a passport. And what it means to transform your body into a passport is actually to, trans to link your body 
to a specific sphere of access to resources. That means like because of how you are marked in the society, you have the ability to access certain resources or you don't have the ability to access certain resources. Uh, I think like it's very clear that actually the freedom of movement uh, allow you to access resources just by the mobility access, uh, like means you can access certain type of education, certain jobs, that you can go places, you can meet people, uh, all of those things, but also like just like you can go and buy food, right? If you are afraid of going to buy food because you can be controlled, uh, obviously that is a very clear example of your access to resources is uh, being limited. Um, and those are things that I think more and more, like I think the, the work that has been done around the AI Act is a very good example of like why coalition building is important because although the, um, the result was not the one we were all hoping for, uh, I think the conversation and also like the indignation, like the fact that, we're, that people, I saw people actually tweeting relentlessly about the fact that what the, 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 the council was doing is legalizing racist profiling. If the coalition work hadn't been done on that, I don't think that's what like the reaction would have been. And that is like, I think in all of the losses, <laughs> let's also see the win, is like actually understanding the law in a completely different way and like, uh, like seeing like, okay, this, this is actually not okay and let's mobilize around that and let's be angry about that. Without the coalition work that has been done, that has revealed and analyzed and actually showed why it was racist, that wouldn't have happened. So I think like, again, just like praising the coalition work that, uh, that has been done there. I see like a lot of people that were part of this coalition work in that room as well, so here we go. Um, and if, if we don't do that work, then we actually are always thinking, oh, it's an ad hoc thing if we have time, it's a charity thing. No, it's core to the framework in which technologies are produced, right? It's a, an economy and without that, and the fact that we see it in every part of like, uh, every area, when we look at tech, there is always something specific on migration. Every, very specific, that is either like the first step to, to try something or like a way of excluding things to test things or because it is a way of actually um, getting uh, more information, we are missing a point and migration is not, um, migration might be a natural phenomenon but this type of migration is not one because it comes from a certain history, right? And what is the history of people moving from the global south to the global north? How, are, how is it? What, what, what happened for that to happen, right? For people to kill themselves going through the Mediterranean Sea. What happened there? What is the history of that, right? And why can I move all around the world like, with my French pass? And why isn't it possible for my cousin that is a Senegalese person? What is the history of that, right? And how is it tech empowered? And if we don't talk about that, and if we ignore that, then we can just, um, yeah. We can just like comment on things and try to add the margin, uh, amend a system that uh, is very unsatisfying, that is increasingly violent, uh, per perhaps even not increasingly, but violent enough that it is actually uh, not uh, uh, like to be suffered. And uh, we are only wasting a lot of time talking about things that are not very relevant. Yeah. <laughs> um, Lots there. I'm not going to try to unpick, but I, I think like one really like relevant point is that like essentially then we're what we're talking about is racism and the the role of digital systems, whether it's technology or broader infrastructures, is then creating that fundamentally different experience of of reality, but also a, a, like a engagement with a certain technology on the basis of race. Um, We'll talk about this more in the context of um, in the context of the field in a little bit. But like as you said, if we're not dealing with this, here's a trend that I'm starting to I want to test on you: is that if we're not dealing with issues like that, then we're just doing digital rights for white people. Do you like this phrase, digital rights for white people? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Another <laughs> differentiation of experience. Um, in terms of how we engage in digital systems is not only on race, is linked to race, but not only on race, is about like the precarity of work, gender, um, and many other things relevant to the experience of sex workers and how they get engaged with digital systems. So, Luca, would you like to tell us a bit more about that? No. 
So, <laughs> what is the question exactly? No, I think, <laughs> I think it's very interesting when you think about the relation between like sex work and digitalization and colonialism, is that laws against prostitution or laws against sex work have always been racist laws. Laws against sex work are laws against women, against migrants, and against poor people. And they've always been like this. Some of the first anti-migration law in the US or the UK were actually anti-sex worker laws. It was laws against like, Chinese migrants in the US, and laws under like, the guise of trafficking in human beings, which were like, really aimed at like, strengthening border and stopping migrant women from selling sex and you know, keeping like, the purity of the race. And the fact that like, we are still now fighting against this big anti-trafficking concept, which is so racist initially, tells you everything about the sex worker rights movement. And what's interesting is that all these debates we're having about sex workers' rights for the last decades are now moving to like digitalization. So the same issue that sex workers face when we're like fighting against bad anti-trafficking laws and policy at the UN level are now moving to like, you know, the UN developing this like cyber security, you know, uh, bills that will also target sex workers. And actually we've seen more and more repression of sex workers globally. Like the vast majority of sex workers, their clients or third parties are criminalized globally. And the majority of sex workers are women, are members of the LGBT community, are racialized, are migrants, are people who use drugs, are people who face intersectional form of discrimination. And you know, obviously, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe you don't know, I'm gonna, inf <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something. I don't know how much you know about <laughs> prostitution. Uh, like in Europe, for example, like one of the dominant models is the Swedish model where clients are criminalized. And this is pushed in particular by a group, uh, different stakeholders, but feminist, white feminist organization in particular, like the European Women Lobby, uh, to not name them, and other organizations <laughs> like the Swedish <laughs> Women Lobby, etc. And for us, it's so unbelievable. Like, you know, I've been a sex worker for most of my life now. And uh, when you look at who sells sex in Europe, majority are migrant women, trans women, racialized people. When you are saying that the best way to protect these people because they are victim of, you know, patriarchal violence is to increase policing of their workplaces. For us, it's such an insult to our communities. Like anyone who knows or opens any magazine would know that increasing policing of a group of mostly racialized women is increasing the risk of violence and the risk of exclusion. And for us, we've been fighting against this monolithic way of thinking that, yeah, all prostitutes are victims of patriarchal violence. The only way to save them against their will is to increase policing is completely absurd. And when we talk about, you know, colonialism, digitalization, sex work, we see the same issues being moved there. And for us, the main question is, Basically, when we talk about this topic and who is included in the conversation, like whose lives are valued and whose needs are met, both in like digitalization but in society as a well. whole, and we see that people who face intersectional form of discrimination, let's say you know in Europe, racialized people, trans people, LGBT migrants, people who use drugs, basically their voice and their needs are not met and are not listened to. And it can be like lip service, as you were saying, about like diversity and equality and inclusion, etc. But the truth is like, it still doesn't matter. If we continue like in 2020, what is it today? Four. Four. <laughs> <laughs> it just feels like I've been, we've been saying that for like the last, you know, hundreds of years. But, you know, <laughs> if in 2024, we still have the main European women rights organization telling that increasing policing is the best solution to address economic and social issues faced by migrant women, like, where do you go from there? And I think for us, being involved in this conversation around digitalization, around like racial justice, around sex workers' rights is so important because you can make connection with other groups who face similar issues in, in different aspects. And what you were saying about precarization of work, that's exactly the same issue. It's like the majority of sex workers, I mean, a few sex workers do pretty well, you know, like some sex workers, they, you know, end up dating a member of parliament, buying a flat, it's like, it's great for them, good for them, and that's important, you know. <laughs> digital rights for white sex workers as well. But the vast majority of sex workers in Europe are precarious people. The vast majority of sex workers in Europe are exploited. And that's why it's so important to include sex workers in discussion around labor rights. The vast majority of sex workers who work on this platform, like OnlyFan, you would see like, you know, the odd, oh, Natasha making 100,000 euro on OnlyFan. Great for Natasha. The vast majority are not Natasha. The vast majority are making a couple of hundreds on OnlyFan. Meanwhile, the OnlyFans boss is making millions of euros. And we're talking about like, how to shut down OnlyFans because it promotes violence against women. The, 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 real, the real conversation we need to have is like, how you fight imbalance of power between men who owns this platform, like whether it's Pornhub or OnlyFans or adult, 
adult work or whatever, in order to create more equality between the workers and the platform. And that's why we need to work with all sectors of society so that we can include the voices of sex workers and the most marginalized, marginalized sex workers into this conversation. Wait, I took notes as well. That's it, that's it. That's it. Yeah, we're switching, we're like commoderating, it's a whole mess. Um, so yeah, now that we've talked about uh, all those uh, very depressing facts, and, but also just like the reality of what we are living in and the things that we are renting on, on a daily basis, um, why do we think the digital rights field as it stands um, does, doesn't bring the change that we need? What is happening? What's what's not happening? Um, how is it like? How is it for you guys? Uh, like from the climate justice uh, movement, from sex workers movement? Yeah, why isn't it clicking? Like the working with the digital rights field? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> um, I mean, good question. Should return it. What's going on, guys? <laughs> Um, I mean, I, well, this is my first experience of being actually involved in the digital rights movement. And before that, I was, of course, aware of it. I was aware there were issues. Um, to be honest, my only experience with, like, guys lecturing me about open source and why using Google is not good. And I'm like, okay, cool, that's great. Not helping. Um, so I think it's like about making, A, making it accessible. Like I have to say, I have, I have no knowledge about anything of the technicalities of this. I didn't feel once in this process that I was, you know, not knowledgeable enough, that I didn't have the clues or, you know, I always felt like I could participate, that I could ask questions if needed, like that I was an equally valuable member of the process, even though I wasn't, didn't have an expertise that other people may have. Uh, and I think that is invaluable. I think, um, I mean, what you said earlier about, you know, thinking about legislation in another way, I think for me that's key. It's about, we don't expect anyone to know everything, but the question is, do you know what you don't know? And do you know people who can help you with what you don't know? Who's in the room when you're having those conversations? Who's in the room when you're deciding your position, your, you know, what you're going to work on, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it happens early on and it can be an afterthought. And I think that goes back to your point earlier. And, and for me, that's, that's the issue is like, I, I get a lot of questions about, oh, how can we work together, et cetera. I'm like, but are you interested in what I'm doing? Did you come to me and, you know, be in my space first to figure out what I'm doing? And then we can figure out something we do together, but don't just expect me to come and, you know, lend whatever it is I can lend, because that also feels extractive. And that's another form of extractivism, going back to what I was saying earlier, but, um, you know, feeling like you're just using people for their knowledge on an issue and then you just move on because it was a one, and that's another thing that I thought was very valuable with this process, it, is, it was three years. It was a very lengthy process and it was not just a one meeting that was kind of, you know, you take a picture, you put it on your website and you feel happy with yourself and, and you move on to, to other things. and. And hopefully the result of that will then be embedded in the content of the work that's being done, which is another key issue is that how do you translate, you can have those conversations and that's great, but what happens very often is that it doesn't translate into the work. And you just move on to your work the next day, forgetting what you talked about and that that's not useful at all. So I think, yeah, that was a bit confused. I don't know if it made sense, but that's just, yeah. I feel like it's, it's about, having conversations, it's about talking, it's about being able to reach out to people and really build relation. It's about relationship building, really. It's about having conversations like this one, having, you know, building relationships with people and different movements um, and, not, and, and, and not being in the silos of, of all of our work that tend to be kind of disconnected, which is exactly what again, we should be fighting against because like you said, look, it's all about power dynamics. All our problems have the same root causes and hopefully we agree that the solution is the same and working in silos is a way of dividing us and distracting us and, you know, we're stronger together to be cheesy, but 
it, it's true. And so if we really work together, then we can get to a solution that is really fighting the overall system that we're trying to fight and rebuild something that we can be proud of and not just fighting on our own little um, you know, corner of, of the field that we can just, um, yeah, and not, not talk to each other. Yeah, just pass it on to you, Cal. Very, very sure. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you work for sex worker rights activism, you do get trashed a lot. You get attacked a lot. Like there is campaigns of like defamation, etc. Like I've been called a pimps many times, uh, and it sounds kind of funny, but it's really not. You know, when you're like working for in like very precarious environment, very little funding, you're using sex work in order to fund your own activism. And you know, you go to a conference and be like, you're a pimp, you profit from violence against women, etc. And you have to stand there and be like, no, as somebody who is a survivor of sexual violence, I'm not. I'm here to tell you that sex work is work and that decriminalization is the right solution and that more police is not the right approach. And you have to do this again and again and again. So we're usually quite excluded from general society and civil society. So when we started to get involved in digital rights, like I guess our threshold is like very low. <laughs> 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 no, but you know, like, you know, even when I approach like the LGBT rights, like ILGA Europe, to be like, what is your position, you know, like, obviously the LGBT network, you must be in favor of, of sex workers' rights. And they were like, hmm, let's first think about this for the next five years and have uh, board meetings and meetings and you go to the conference, you're like, oh, okay, so there's really a big process for you to come to a decision. And so actually in the digital rights field, it felt much more welcoming. People were like, oh, it's great, sex workers' rights, let's discuss about it. But then we realized we were talking with like maybe a fringe of the digital rights movement <laughs> with some people on the panel before realizing that they were like wider conversation, like both within a dream membership and the wider like digital rights movement about how wide should the digital rights movement be and how political it should be. Should the digital rights movement include questions related to sex work, for example? And from my understand, people, understanding, people would say like, well, no, actually, we are like, you know, diluting our issue. We are fighting around like privacy. We should not talk about sex workers' rights. And for us, it's really like, if you're not talking about some of the most marginalized people who are facing the blunt of like policing, uh, you know, privacy, discrimination, censorship, etc., then you are really failing your mission. We're not even saying that in a sense of like, oh, you have to include us because our issue matters more than other issues. That is your mission is to fight for the right to privacy for people in general. Then start by those who, whose privacy is more at risk. Start with undocumented migrants, start with racialized people, start with sex workers. And then once you manage to tackle this issue, then you'll be able to tackle the issues of like wider society. So I think we had a bit of like honeymoon with the digital rights movement being like, Yoy! oh, okay, you have the same issue as many of us there. That's it. <laughs> Luca is like the mic drop guy. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think like you talked about like extractivist dynamic and also um, the question of partnerships and how they built. Um, also the question of vocabulary. Do we understand what we are saying to each other? Um, and Luca, you talked basically about who gets to decide what is privacy um, and who gets to exclude people and who gets to decide uh, what is in and what is out. Um, and that pr probably the, 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 the makeup of the current digital rights field uh, determines who, <laughs> who are those people and who is out. And that might be a bit the, the issue. Um, Sarah Chenda, as the absolute insider of the digital rights field, <laughs> she's like, why, why, why are you doing this to me? Uh, what, what did you observe internally? What's your diagnosis, objective diagnosis of what, what do you think, like, perhaps sometimes it doesn't click even when we're trying? Yeah, as the face of the European digital rights field. <laughs> I'm um, As an insider to the European digital rights field, I can say that maybe I wouldn't consider my entry into it as a honeymoon. So good, good for you if you had a honeymoon. But I didn't get one yet. But I, I think that there's, while a lot of things that we're talking about are in a constant flux of change, so it's important to recognize that. Nothing we are saying is um, true about every um, form of digital rights activism and it's constantly changing and improving by the fact that like people like you are willing to come to a conversation like this and that people like us are willing to work for three years on the topic. Nothing is, 
that being said, like I think that there's many issues that we could talk about on top of the ones Luca and Miriam has mentioned that sort of present a flaw to how far the digital rights movement um, is able to address some of the very difficult big problems that we talked about at the start. Um, one relates to what we've talked about, Luca mentioned about like, okay, how do we even understand digital rights as a concept? Um, you mentioned, okay, in some way, it's been very much sort of a battle to um, even argue that some of these issues are digital rights issues, which is, in, in essence, is, is one way of saying, your struggles are not relevant, <laughs> actually. Um, maybe not framed in those words, but in essence, that is the tone of what is being said. So this, um, we've talked about a lot very much that, okay, we're here at privacy camp, but in, in some ways there is very much a data protection and privacy primacy in these spaces that actually not just excludes the experience of some people and some communities, marginalized communities of those very same issues like privacy, like data protection. It's interesting also to talk about the data protection of migrants, for example, but that's not a priority of this field. But also, on the other hand, explore, like not um, viewing into our conception of digital rights of these broader socio-political issues, like the colonial dynamics of extractivism to tech, like the systematic sort of violence directed at migrants that the European policy system mentions and, and, and necessitates, as Laurent mentioned, through digital systems. All of those issues for us is very clear are digital issues. However, it's had to, a whole piece of work in itself is to advocate that that is a digital issue. And that's a problem. That's a very big problem. Um, other sorts of dynamics that we thought need to change if we're actually going to address some of these issues are more sort of about, less about what is the concepts and what are the high level concepts, but generally also how the field operates. So we reflected a lot, a little bit about sort of questions of paternalism in the field, even if we are open to the changing topics a little bit, questions of paternalism, questions of exclusion, certain people not being in the room or in the conversation, or if they are entering the room, it's as tokens. Um, and that's, I think, very much related to this idea of expertise hoarding, technical expertise being valued over other forms of expertise. Um, another thing that we've talked about already is sort of this extractivism. So even if we do agree that certain um, communities should be involved, whose terms are they invited into conversations on? And are they invited if they're like framing an issue in a different way than what we want to, to frame them? So for example, it might be very easy um, to invite a woman of color to talk on data protection if, if it's the exact terms that you want them to talk about. Is it very easy to change the underlying concepts that you are working on? The last type of issue I want to raise that I think is a problem that we really sought to address is also political stance. And I, here I don't mean just our analysis of the problem, but also what type of change are we hoping to see and how. Um, this is a problem, I think, beyond the digital rights field. I think it's a problem in the NGO industrial complex as, as it is, is that we are prioritizing certain visions of change, certain methodologies and strategies, because they're what we've always done not objectively analyzing, do they bring change? Um, why are we ad prioritizing advocacy and research and retelling again the story of harm of other people, as opposed to looking at other more inventive ways, looking at other more participatory ways of bringing change and looking at really how, what sort of things could we do that could fundamentally challenge these big uh, systems that we're talking about, as opposed to sort of relying on these problems to exist so that our NGOs can t continue to exist. That question of like reformism and sort of the extent to which we're willing to go, I think is a very big issue related to this question of decolonizing, right? Um, if we're not open to sort of different ways of organizing, not just different people doing the organizing, but different methods of organizing, then we're not gonna get to addressing those um, same issues. So that I think maybe bringing us on, if that's okay with you, to, to why we are here and what was the product of this collective work and was actually thinking about, okay, what would that alternative vision of change be? What would that alternative ecosystem, what type of ecosystem and what type of digital organizing do we actually want to see? And that very much was the product of the three-year process that we've talked about. 
Um, so with that being said, I would love um, if we could change the slide. Yes, we also had slides. Uh, thank you, Chiara. Um, with that being said, I would love if you, Laurence, would take some time to, to talk a little bit about like, all of that very <laughs> depressive stuff being said. What is the vision that came out of this collective work and how do you see a different form of digital rights organizing? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think one of the things is, uh, specifically right now, and also with all the things that you've mentioned, uh, both of you, like all of you, uh, regarding Congo, Palestine, Sudan, Haiti, um, Tigray, I think like the list is non-exhaustive and that's perhaps what is so um, depressing. Um, we can't afford despair. Right, we need to hope, and and yet like we are all in a state of quite like big despair. Like around me, like people are yeah, it's just hard, right? <laughs> right now, it's hard to find the the technology of hope in in ourselves, um, and yet we need to hope because we come from uh, generations of people that have used hope as a motor to advance and create change and make things happen when it didn't seem possible, right? So I mean, like, this is also a tradition of change. Um, so how do we create hope, what, right? What is the technology of hope and how do we make it happen? I think it was a bit like the question that is, was underlying um, this, um, this process. Now I'm saying that retrospectively, obviously. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, Listening today to a lot of the discussions, what was uh, very striking is um, at the, the first panel that I went to, so I mentioned it, the digital welfare state, uh, Alex from La Quadrature du Net, he was t talking about the, um, the question of the litigation and what they were planning on attacking, right? They were like, okay, the, it, it, it's about the risk assessment system uh, in France that is used by um, the, the, La CAF, which is like the... Um, how do you explain that? The 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 basically like like childcare benefit. Yeah, thank you. Childcare benefit, uh, family benefit in France, and um, it has been proven that it's discriminatory to uh, to a certain degree. Like the researcher have the algorithm, and they're planning to take it to court. Um, and they're like, okay, but the the algorithm is discriminatory because. The policies that they are like implementing is discriminatory. So the algorithm is actually efficient in the framework that is discriminatory, and that's uh, that's the issue, right? And they were like, okay, but why are we attacking in court? If we need, if we attack the question of discrimination, we are we going as far as attacking then the framework in which uh, they are embedded? Um, and I think other discussions, well, I, I think the uh, in CEDA's uh, moderated uh, panel around infrastructure, I think. It was an invitation of rethinking, redefining what privacy means on one hand, and also what privacy does, uh, specifically within the framework of digital rights. Are we actually, through uh, the current framework that we're using, uh, empowering big tech, which I, I'm supposing is not the, the goal of many of us in the room because of the framework that we have actually, the encryption uh, industrial complex, as we could call it, is actually uh, 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 reinforcing big tech instead of uh, dismantling them. Uh, how are we uh, understanding privacy as within a democratic uh, question? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people then were asking in the Q&A, how do we then, if the legal framework doesn't work, what do we do? How do we do it? Um, and I think a lot of us sometimes we're like, okay, we have done the research. We know what the problem is, right? I think like a lot of the things we said before, Everybody was like, okay, yeah, we know about that. This is fucking depressing. What do we do, right? <laughs> and how do we do it? Sorry, I was cursing. It is <laughs> awfully depressing. <laughs> how do we do it? What do we do? Uh, um, and so the process basically was like three years of all of us exactly being in that state of like, Pending between like, oh, this is depressing. What do we do? How do we do it? I don't have an ID. Do you have an ID? Oh, no, I don't know. Oh, this is horrible. Is this horrible? Anyway, and at the end, something happened, which is a program, which I think like all of us, while we were making it, were very unsure that it would happen. <laughs> so I think that's also about just like leaning into uh, the uncertain. It's an invitation to that. And in the end, uh, 
came this ecosystem that you can see that was uh, illustrated by Critica. And so this ecosystem was about thinking what would a digital justice system for Europe look like? And because if we understand that digital justice is trans feminist, migration, disability, um, racial, social, environmental justice, all of that, what, what is not happening right now in Europe that needs to happen and how can we make it happen? So one of the diagnoses is uh, we don't have a shared language. Okay, this is a diagnosis. How do we get to that point that we have a shared language or a shared understanding? Uh, we, uh, the, the, like the decision makers are not probably appropriate for to, to help uh, to make the change happen that a lot of us wish to, uh, uh, that, uh, that, a lot of, that a lot of us wish for. Okay, how do we change that? Um, the question of, um, what was your point actually, uh, Sarah? <laughs> She's like, I made so many good points. <laughs> the, like, the agenda setting was one of them, like how do we understand digital rights, reformism, and that's one. Yeah, exactly, the, 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 the tactic, the practices. So, uh, how do we create places where we can reinvent practices uh, to imagine the worlds that we want? I think all of those elements uh, are part of the, the ecosystem now. So basically, the, the ecosystem is organized uh, around two main ideas, two main principles, which are like imagining, uh, organizing, and supporting. So imagining is important because as we have talked about right now, sometimes we are at a loss when we think about what can we do? So we need to invest in imagination. We need to invest in how we actually do things and how, what are the digital rights and how, what are the digital realities we want, right? Because often we are backed into just commenting on a world that is not the one we are dreaming of and we're just like stuck into what is impossible and we're just like, okay, this is impossible, so let's negotiate with like the, 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 the violent reality that we're in. What about we imagine it? What, is the, what are the digital realities that we want? What are the digital futures that we actually want? What do they look like? How complex are they? How multiple are they? How rich are they, right? Uh, where are the rooms in the digital rights field currently where that is happening? Right? I mean, like, that's, if we look at it, it's not happening. Often we are like stuck into, and it's very important, understanding what is going wrong. But where are we imagining what could go right? Um, so that is like with the knowledge and imagining spaces, that's one part of uh, the program uh, about creating that, those rooms, uh, centering uh, trans feminist uh, organization, black feminist organizations, environmental justice organizations that are invited to meet in retreats and just like with the support of technologists and researchers uh, as the questions they want to ask, like as stupid as they think they could be about like tech and also just think about, okay, Let's imagine, what, what would it look like? What would we do? If we were the one developing algorithm, what would it, what it, would it look like? If we were the one developing infrastructures, <laughs> what type of infrastructures would we develop? Like those kind of things, like the, the sheer things of imagining. And then at the end of those retreats would be, okay, what type of research piece, what type of knowledge do you want to work on from the la for the next year, two years, to be able to concretize one piece of it? Right? Just like, what type of knowledge don't you have that you would need to be further along your dream? Right? And then, like, working on that. So, like, again, doing research, like, community-centered research is also about that. It's like investing in the dreams and the imagining of people. And that could be also about, like, actually doing research on negative things, but, but to turn them around, right? So, it's just about, like, the projection. Uh, the digital liberation retreat uh, is a place where the people meet, because what we don't have in Europe uh, is a place where uh, racial justice organizations, social justice organizations, environmental justice organizations, trans feminist organizations, migrant organizations, uh, and digital justice organizations all meet together and center the question of justice and tech. Because I think a lot of us have had the experience that we meet at digital rights uh, events and we are invited in, which is like, thank you, but, <laughs> but uh, we have to have the discussion we want to have actually as 
like sideways. Like we have the discussions in between the sessions. We have the discussions afterwards. It's like, okay, let's grab a drink and talk about actually like everything is happening. And probably it's also vital and it's, uh, it's normal to do that. But what, what, ha what would be if the whole retreat was about justice, right? Centering justice and how we fight for justice, taking into account the digital realities we live in, right? And that's the, the dream behind digital liberation, uh, the digital liberation retreat would be like four to five, it will be, the, it, it's going to happen, it will be like four uh, days, five days per, perhaps. It's going to be hopefully very spacious, so like they, people are not going to feel like they run from one session to the other, <laughs> just like that's one thing. Uh, not, it's not a critic to the privacy camp, Great organization, you all. Uh, <laughs> just, just like in general, um, it's, um, it will be hopefully also centering practices of joy because joy you need it to, to actually uh, create hope. Uh, it will talk about practices, so how do we do things as well as content, so what are we doing things on? Um, and that will concern not only uh, organizational structures, so what type of organizations do we need to make the work, the radical work that we are aiming for, because of, often also the organizational structures that we're in are limiting our capacity to do things, right? So what type of organizations do we need and how do we get there? And a lot of people have, do, have done a lot of work, are doing a lot of work to do that. The thing is we don't have a space to share it. So perhaps like the digital liberation retreat is that space. Um, Talking about funding, because another thing that is not really helping us transforming things is the way funding is structured. So having discussions among grantees about what is going on and what, is, what needs to change. What are the issues they've been encountering uh, when it relates to funding? How do they want to organize around that instead of having like siloed fights uh, with their funders? Is there a way of collectively like fighting against it? Um, so there is, there is going to be a space for that. And the other thing is having a joint vision, not for five next years, but perhaps for the year to come. And one of the, the things we're aiming for at the Digital Liberation Retreat is to have a digital justice manifesto. So uh, something that is going to be the priorities for the year to come in terms of thematic things where people think, okay, it will be very important if we are working on that, like concentrating effort on that. Probably we, it could be like an opportunity to build coalition around that. And it could be like something, something that is adding to a, an existing coalition. So saying like, okay, perhaps we don't, we're not talking about that yet. How do we uh, have resources to do that? Or it could be a new idea for people that are not like already working together to be able to work together. It also uh, obviously is meant to be a call to the funders to say like, we have our priorities, are they matching yours? And if not, why, right? Because I think also <laughs> that's also important, it's also important to, to, to have those conversations. Um, so that's the digital liberation retreat that's around um, organizing. Um, I'm, I'm giving snippets, there are much more elements in the program that is going to be available soon, so you can see all of the wonderful elements, I'm doing just like examples. Um, another one that I like is the, um, am, I, am I still in yours? Uh, okay, then I, then I just like, <laughs> just, oh yeah, and the other thing that we want to do is uh, be able to resource those activities because obviously one of the things that also is preventing racial, social, economic, trans feminist, environmental, uh, migration, disability, uh, uh, social justice organizations to be more uh, active when it comes to digital uh, issues is just they don't, they are drastically under-resourced. We are not well resourced. Uh, I mean, like, yeah. I mean, as a fund, uh, <laughs> working for a funder, perhaps I'm like. But uh, a lot of digital rights organizations are not well resourced. Uh, but the other organizations are even less uh, resourced, uh, and I think that's a, a big problem. Um, and so the, one of the ideas, like, to resource them and to resource them in a way that is also aligned with an understanding of philanthropy as the problem, not the solution. Um, so how do we do that? And so I think one of the questions that you are asking yourself, but perhaps, is, okay, it's ambitious, it's a lot of things, who is going to coordinate all of that? And so I think that's one of the questions that the, the participants also say, asked, and they were also very adamant that although Edry and DFF have been uh, leading on that work for uh, uh, up until now, uh, 
they were not perhaps the, the, the best equipped to continue that because uh, both very much uh, in the digital rights field, but central to that, also like both actually organized by the digital rights field. So also like, we are like, uh, also, yeah, what is this noise? <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, we are also very much like uh, within this type of practices. Um, so what we are trying to develop now, and we are try uh, we are developing now, is a new entity that is going to be a hosted like um, for for the time being at DFF, which is called Weaving Liberation. Because one of the things that was also a bit complicated with the process is the name. So, for example, Star Chender that is here has never gotten the name right once <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps on calling it decolonizing digital rights there. It's decolonizing the digital rights field in Europe process. <laughs> but exactly, it's too long. <laughs> so like, we're just like, it's, <laughs> you're just like, you're, you're playing with my nerves. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, we, we're calling this uh, new entity Weaving Liberation. It is going to be uh, an entity that is, uh, that aims at coordinating the digital liberation retre retreat, uh, supporting organizations to get into contact with one another, uh, also pre creating um, uh, material and also support for organizational exchange, but also partnerships, so like technologies of partnerships, so that they're not uh, uh, extractivist. Um, and also uh, do some funding. So it's never going to like, Hopefully, at some point, we're going to get uh, Mackenzie Scott grant, and then we can give a lot of money. But until then, we, it's not going to be core funding uh, in that sense, or like not substantial core funding, but it's still going to uh, hopefully uh, support uh, the organizations in a way that they can develop their capacity when it comes to digital rights issues. And now I'm, yeah, I'm going to give you the floor, Sarah Chanda. So, yeah. <laughs> The, could we go to the next slide, please, Kiara? So this was a bit of an introduction to the program and also how that will go on in the future. So thank you, Lahans, for that. Um, as maybe as two participants in the process who actually created that program amongst others, amongst 28 others, Miriam and Luca, um, is there anything specific from the program that you think people who are just starting to engage with this idea this vision of this new ecosystem, is there anything particularly you think that they, what, is there anything particularly remarkable that you want to point out of it? Is there anything you particularly you want to share? No, I think I would say I was involved in the process and I'm afraid I'm going to get the name wrong as well. The process we're talking about, I was very involved from the beginning. And it was a bit complicated at the beginning to understand what it was about, because it was actually very ambitious. And you know when everybody who's working for an NGO or something, like you're such on the day-to-day -day responses, like, oh, there's a new submission response I have to make, I have to do this report, etc. And suddenly there was like, oh, we're going to take our time to do this right. And it was, maybe it wasn't like right the whole time, like there was like some tension and things like this, but it was really like this several year process of coming together and discussing like what are we talking about when we talk about decolonizing the digital rights fields in Europe program. <laughs> Gosh. Um, and then we came up with like, you know, this plan, strategy, etc. And I think for us it was also like the opportunity to really ask important question where we basically don't have the answer. And I was part of the, the funding working group with several people who are either working for funders or working for NGOs, uh, underfunded, underrepresented, etc. And we had the opportunity to talk in depth about what would, you know, uh, a just approach look like in a relation between funders and our organization. And the truth is like, there is no answer to this. Like, we shouldn't need philanthropy to survive and to fight for a better world. Like we know this, we shouldn't depend on Mackenzie, who's the wife of Bezos, right? Uh, you know, ex-wife, like, no, 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 I mean, we need her now. She's in the room. But I think there is this like huge, you know, like this huge paradox of like our organization who are fighting for like racial, economic, social justice to say like, oh, what is the best way to like, you know, relate with funders where their funding is coming from 
mostly like you know big capitalist uh, you know enterprise etc and i think like there was some really good conversation about this and like i think one of the outcomes is to create like continue this conversation and have for example like a lab that will bring together different representatives of both like ngo marginalized communities and funders as well to discuss how can we improve our relationship how can we work together so that your aim and our aim aligns as well and if you say if your aims don't align with us like, you know, how do we make you change that so then your aims are a bit more right. But I feel that, you know, I'm on the steering committee of the Red Umbrella Fund, which is one of the main, the only funder by and for sex workers. And all these questions are so important because we spend so many time begging for money in order to do the work that's vital. And I think we all know this, that it's like, over, like we are overworked, underpaid, and like we're constantly in like this demanding situation with funders in order, like you know, for sex workers' rights, it's just absurd, like the, how little money there is. And we basically are like on one year contract, and hopefully we got enough money next year to continue our work. And it shouldn't be like this, and it shouldn't be like this for any organization, but then it doesn't really question like why are these funders able to access such huge funding when they come from like, you know, Amazon, etc. So I think it's sort of like questioning this relationship between grantees and donors, but looking as well as creating, how was like the, call, the name we, we had for it? Reimagining and redistributing. But it was in particular, for example, like, you know, grantees coalition where grantees could come together. Like, you know, lots of us are, for example, getting funding from the same funder, but we don't talk with one another and we're like put into this competition with like, oh, you know, Again, for sex workers' rights, it's ridiculous. There is two regional networks in the region, and we are constantly in competition for like an extremely small amount of money, and it shouldn't be like this. And funders should realize like this, that they are fostering competition between groups in, in order to like distribute a bit of money. So I think there's all this conversation around funding that were very interesting, and hopefully we can continue to have them. Um, I, well, bef actually before I say something, I just, what you said earlier about people in the movement, in the digital rights movement, talking about how political the movement should be, that is very triggering to me as someone from the climate movement, and it gives me cold shivers, so maybe I can impart some wisdom. As someone who's been in the climate movement for many years, your movement should be as political as possible, because the climate movement is hot garbage right now. It is a hot mess, because so many people refuse to make it political because as soon as it doesn't come to fucking recycling, no one can agree on anything. And it's just, it's impossible. Like, look at what's going on right now. And because we're getting to a world that is more and more on fire and we have more and more, you know, what is this new word people came with? Like, super crisis, intra crisis? Like, I mean, things are linked. Everything is linked. And the crises that we're going to see in the future are going to be linked. And if you work on a single issue, you're not going to know how to respond to it. You're going to be completely lost. You're going to become irrelevant, which is honestly, sorry, but what's happening right now with, with some climate organization, and as it should be. But it's just, you know, just don't do this. Please, please don't do this. I mean, maybe. <laughs> like, the, you know, climate for <laughs> white it? people is like gardening, maybe privacy is, is digital rights for right people, yeah. <laughs> We're going to work on that. We'll, we'll get a t-shirt soon, merch coming. <laughs> no, just, yeah, just, it, was, it was that point. Um, and I think, well, I had the same point as you, so you stole my point uh, about the retreat. It's fine. I think one thing that came, well, for me that was interesting is that, so we worked in different working groups, right? We came together in plenaries, et cetera, discussed, but the bulk of the work was done in, in smaller groups. Um, and this retreat, in some form or the other, came up in most of the groups. And for me, that was really something that was a testament to people's need for, for connection, for communication, for like having, holding space to come together. And I think that's also one of the things I found most valuable about the process is that the holding of the space of, you know, which, isn't necessarily you're leading something or you're coordinating, but it's just organizing a space for people to feel able to come and empowered and have discussion there and then kind of making sure that things happen along the way. But yeah, it really is something that came up in, in a lot of the working groups. And I was like, well, that's interesting. We didn't talk about this at all with different groups, but everybody came up with some version of, we need to get together in a room and talk with kind of space and time to talk about what we want. And I think, that hopefully for me is also, because like you said, look, everything's about power. We need to build power. And that's another great thing about this program is it's really focused on building power and empowering each other. And then once you have that, and once you have the common vision, that's where the kind of diversity of tactic 
comes in. It's like you might need some advocacy, you might need some legal, you know, uh, strategic litigation, you might, et cetera, et cetera. But, but if we all to work together towards the same vision, then that's great. Then we're reinforcing each other and, you know, we're all kind of fulfilling our own role within the movement, the ecosystem of the movement. But if we don't have the same goals and we're basically kind of fighting over each other, canceling each other out, which again is think, something that happens a lot in the climate movement because, because of this lack of of political vision and analysis, then that's when things kind of become an issue. Um, and I, on the hope, I always go back to uh, Mariam Kaba, who said, hope is a discipline, and that's the yeah, inspiring yeah. quote of the day for you. Yeah, definitely, I've been mean, like Mariam Kaba, but also like, I want to quote Magic and Cissé, who was uh, a leader in this, uh, the movement of the Sans Papier in France. <laughs> And we also said, like, the only battle that are already lost is the one we don't, we are not uh, taking, right? And I think it's also about fighting for the things we need instead of the things we think we can have. Um, yeah, I think there is also something to be said about the program is a lot of the reflection of the process. Like the things that we saw working in the process that we valued in the process are actually now in the program. So it's like a bit of like, I think um, that, that, and that I think we like, we did it more or less consciously, but I think like, and in the end when reading the program it was like a lot of things are, things are happen in smaller ways in the process. So that was also interesting to see. Um, yeah, three minutes left, Q and A, no? <laughs> Someone has a question? Yeah, yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, I can run to you. Or, yeah, or Claire can run to you. <laughs> that's working, Claire. <laughs> beautifully, that's beautifully working. Thank you. Uh, so I will try to be short. Um, so I'm wondering if you have like an organization who is just getting started on their journey to be like into the digital rights field, uh, then do you have no, some kind of tips or reflections to make? Uh, so. Um, more precisely, I'm thinking that uh, if you're working, like I'm from an organization working on the rights of persons with disabilities, and uh, one problem is that many times uh, someone who makes like something that's supposed to be an assistive technology, let's say a speech recognition that makes into text what you're saying, uh, they forget to train it on for people who have speech difficulties, and then it doesn't become that tool that it should be. Uh, and I think um, generally, we, if we want to solve the problem, maybe we have to be more uh, active as a disability rights movement, maybe train our members so they know how to give feedback to developers, but at the same time, from a principal point of view, then we're sort of making the work of the inventors in some way. And I was wondering, like, reasoning there may, between what's right from a principal point of view and maybe what's more uh, practical to make, to solve the problem, if you have any reflections to contribute with on that issue if you encountered it during when you worked on the program. Thank you. If there are, it will be responded to. Is there any other question? <laughs> I'm not ignoring you, I'm just being told to ask if there are more questions and now there are no other questions. Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> we are at time. <sighs> So slow. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so my name is Meher. I've, uh, thank you for the panel, first of all. It was really, really uh, interesting, brilliant, and I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is more like, uh, uh, you know, like there are so many things that, as a, as a person that works in the Brussels kind of uh, NGO bubble, and we deal a lot of like, I feel like we are always kind of um, doing more like fire extinguishing all the time when, like commission throws one bad proposal after the other and a lot of people in the room I think feel the same and sometimes we don't uh, have you know the, the time to kind of imagine and reflect and have this space to to imagine a better world so I feel we have these discussions which are really inspiring but then we go back and we just do the same things over and over and, and 
like if you have any advice uh, for people like me, like now I'm gonna go back and how can we bring this kind of uh, creating space within the organizations that we work, like how do we communicate it to our management, for example, or how do we propose changes to the structures of our organizations that would allow us to take the space and time and to, to kind of imagine a world and, and take the time to change things maybe slowly, but yeah. So I hope I was clear. It would be very useful. Thank you. Short answer to each one? Let's take like 20 minutes and finish Claire. Claire is like, talk about the good things. Claire is just saying like, there is a whole piece of work that we did that I'm not mentioning, and she's a bit pissed. <laughs> This is why we're creating weaving liberation to free ourselves from. <laughs> this is not true. Obviously not true. Uh, on the question, uh, the first question, I think, I think the two questions are related because it's about like um, imagining the tech worlds that serve us, and how do we do that in a way that we are not self-exploiting, uh, like we're not self-exploiting. Um, so I think there is different ways uh, to think about it. In the digital world, right, in the digital rights world, digital activism world, there are a lot of people that are like developing software, less people that are developing their own hardware, but they have like their own servers and stuff like that. So a lot of people that are doing that, right? Uh, the question is, why are they never like in conversation? Why are they never in our groups? So I think one of the things that like in the, um, in the, in the, in the program, one of the elements is the, I think it's the digital coalition that it's called, and it's exactly about like creating the spaces where technologies, but also researchers and uh, and uh, uh, different organizations get in contact to build designs, right? And I think like obviously this is limited because to build any software, depending on how complex they are, it demands a lot of money, and it also at some point, and I think it was also touched upon this morning, you have to rely on other <laughs> type of systems. So like I think like that's a bit like where this dreaming uh, is uh, a bit limited for now. But it's still like, for example, I think for your for the software you were mentioning, like if you were in contact with technologies and created something that was open source and something like that, perhaps that's a, a solution. The question is like, where is the money that you could find to do that? Is that where your priority lies right now? It seems like it's a it's a high priority or something like that. Um, and then like, how do we create the space for that? You know, and I think like for example, that's literally what you say, what you did is what we want to do in the knowledge and imagining space. So having this conversation is like, oh yeah, that is not possible. How do we do that? What are like the um, the barriers to do that? What are like our uh, the risks to doing that and how do we mitigate those risks and what do we need in the room and who do we need in the room? And I think that right now there are no specific space for that uh, because it, it happens probably in your organization that you have this conversation, but probably it happens in a lot of other disability justice organizations uh, all over Europe. Uh, so like, what happens if you all get in a room? What are, going, what are you going to come up with, right? And it's a bit like the, the idea of, uh, um, of that. And I think for Meher, your question, is a bit linked as well, is I think, again, if we don't change organizations, we, are we will be unable to change the results. So if we don't have organizations that actually create room for imagining, then you can't do it. Because what are you going to do? You're not going to sleep? You, you know, it's like, you can't, you just like, this is the, the truth is like, you need, like, the, it's the shift, like, it's a collective question. It's like, how do we collectively organize around imagining as a tool, as an effective tool for change? How do we think it is effective? How do we use, for example, like the, the next file from the commission as a tool for imagining, you know? So like, instead of having the, the, the only, the like, how do we uh, uh, use the amendment work as a tool for imagining, which is, which is already, right? I mean, like, every time you write an amendment, what you're, try what you're writing is a, a fictional world. Right, like an alternative reality. I think the problem is, are we embracing that fully when we do that work? Or what are we negotiating with when we are write them? And why are we negotiating that? I think the question is then, like, what are the conditions to be able to not negotiate when we do the amendments work, uh, when we do that? And it's uh, the question of strategy. So who are we in strategy with? Who are we in coalition with? 
uh, how do we prepare the amendment when we're in co coalition? Are we giving like the space when we do the coalition work for full on imagining without the imagination being interrupted? Because I think often also, uh, and I think it's part of the process, but let's be aware of the voice in ourselves that says it's not realistic. Because it's not realistic for whom? Because I think like this world is not realistic for a lot of people to still live in it. So for whom is it, isn't it realistic and why aren't we like going for it? So I think like that's that my answer, I don't know if it's really helpful, but I think like it's about organizational change, it's about practice, uh, change of practices and it's about creating the spaces for, uh, for those discussions. Do, do, do either of you want to add? Otherwise, I can maybe sum up. Yeah, go for it. No, add. No, I think the question around, like, okay. you know... <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm going to... Oh, wait, what? In 30 seconds. No, okay, go. Speak. I spoke enough. Um, speak to me after the break. <laughs> so, a, a, a theme of this work, maybe to sum up, is that it's quite long. And this uh, panel is a metaphor for that. Um, but also uh, just a sort of testament to the fact that, that these are really deep conversations and they're really like way beyond the reactionary policy spaces, reactionary organizing spaces that we often find ourselves in. And we need to have conversations like that if we're actually going to make meaningful change. So that being said, I really hope that um, you come to us you are interested to engage more with the program and the vision that we put out. You'll hear more uh, from Weaving Liberation and from the program when it's released, so please do engage with it. And just thank you so much, even though you didn't get to say anything. Um, thank you so much for coming to this conversation with us. And thank you to you all.